Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion. What, one minute more, and since we are recording this meeting, we will start with a short intro uh, about Miro, just for those who don't maybe know yet about the product, and then uh, I will pass the mic to the uh, panelists uh, of today. We will have uh, five panelists today from um, the Lee Agency and um, staff and uh, students from Winthrop University. So yeah, probably I will uh, kick things off with a short mirror intro and we'll be waiting while people are joining. Okay, so um, my name is Natalie Nedry, and uh, I'm running marketing programs uh, for EDU and nonprofit users here in Miro. And uh, Miro, basically, for those who maybe don't know yet, the product is the collaborative online whiteboard used commonly by lots of um, companies, but students and teachers as well. So we've been changing the world since. Um, 2012, uh, growing rapidly, uh, now having more than 15 million uh, loyal users and offices spread uh, across the globe. And uh, right now, Miro, uh, especially because of some um, uh, circumstances of the previous year, and uh, a shift towards blended learning, online learning. We know that students and teachers from top universities use Miro for different use cases. And we are happy to share that uh, students and teachers can apply for free Miro accounts uh, to use during uh, their uh, studying and working processes. So that's the intro, uh, and now I'm really happy to uh, kick off our panel discussion, and um, I will pass, pass the mic to our panelists, uh, Eric, Julia, Julia Jess, uh, Eleanor, and one more panelist. Um, so let's, let's start. I will stop sharing my screen. And yeah, Eric, Julia, jump in. So thanks, Natalie. It's a treat to be with you all. We are going to try to make this a really valuable use of your time. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And so I'm really excited to be uh, here with you all. Thanks to Natalie and Miro and, and her team. But also, we're really excited because we have some special guests and Natalie mentioned from Winthrop University. But before I introduce those, um, I'm again, Eric Gorman from Wiley. And I'm here with my uh, esteemed colleague, uh, super talented, both my left and right hands, uh, Julia Jackson. You want to say a quick hello, Julia? Hi, guys. I'm Julia with Wiley, and it's, it's a delight to be here with you guys. Um, I have a love for all things education. My husband is a teacher um, at the elementary and middle school level, and so I really appreciate all the valuable work that, that educators are doing. Um, and I've also done a lot of consulting for uh, Two and a half decades um, focused a lot on nonprofits and um, and education and, and school systems. So I'm delighted to be here with you guys. So just a really quick little bit about us. I'm going to share my screen here. So bear with me just a moment. Looks like that is coming through. Cool. So quickly, we really exist to help change agents, people that want to uh, do something big, tackle a big challenge. And ultimately that allows them to do their life's best work. And so we help teams innovate and really reduce the risk of doing so. So we often get a call or an email saying, hey, I'm stuck. Uh, I recognize that there's gotta be a better way to do this. Can you help us out? And what we do is we really deliver, we deliver that value through sprint workshops and training. So you're gonna get to see some of that today in our session. Really, we wanna focus primarily on the stories that our guests are gonna be sharing with you from their experience 
and some of the challenges that they shared, but we are definitely going to be taking a little bit of time and kind of sharing the thought process and certainly the process. We'll have some uh, of those workshop kind of templates or different activities that we use for the different workshops we're going to be walking you through today. And we'll kind of illustrate those and share our screens with those. Um, certainly, if you have any questions at any point, drop those in chat. We are going to do our best to hold the last 15 minutes of today for Q&A. So definitely be aware of that, that that's coming. But certainly if you have a burning question, feel free to drop it in chat. Julie's going to be monitoring that very closely. And so she'll interrupt me and say, hey, we had a really good question. And we'll try to address those on the spot if that makes most sense to do so on the fly. So quickly, a little bit more about us. Um, we really do, you know, just a little bit more about these sprint workshops that I mentioned. I'm going to uh, have a little bit more information about that in just a second too. But really at their core, it's about structuring collaborative time together to tackle big challenges. So the defaults there on the left are some of the ways that we find, and I'm, we've experienced this working professionally before starting Wiley, but certainly we see a lot of teams facing these types of challenges where the default is to kick off a big project or have a big team meeting to kind of start. And we default into a big group brainstorm, which often devolves into a lot of pitching and debating and swirling and not a lot of decisions being made and not a lot of progress being made. And oftentimes, Meetings are like bunnies, they breed more and more of them. And so you often find yourself in this endless cycle of meetings. And we really try to be intentional about breaking that. And the way we do that is really through some intentional principles that we instill into the design of each of the workshop engagements, these sprint workshops that we run with client teams. So this concept of working alone together, and we'll get to hear from Eli and Eleanor, um, and as well as Jesse about their experience of doing this and living this and the engagements that we ran with them. But just a little bit about that, you know, it's really, we find that the best way to get a lot out of all of our smart brains and kind of hijack the way we are really wired is to work alone together. So that means working in parallel and then coming back together as a group to quickly assess, maybe vote or evaluate the different challenges or ideas that were generated working alone. So you'll get to see a little bit more about that as we kind of walk you through the workshops today, but it's something that we really believe in and something that's really effective to make rapid progress. Again, hijack the best of our individual thinking, make sure that you have a, everyone's voices is, are heard um, rather than kind of losing uh, to the biggest or loudest, biggest personality or loudest voice in the room. The second principle there, fast and decisive. So Really, we believe in moving quickly. We structure the, the time together very intentionally. We time box everything we do. We're really religious about that. And what we find is by having this kind of really kind of robust structure and be very uh, judicial about how we use time, we're able to move through the process much more quickly, move through a challenge much more quickly. And ultimately that leaves a team feeling much more emboldened and uh, really kind of a big morale boost from the end of the engagement, which is really important as you're tackling big challenges, you have to be mindful of your humans, right? So your team is a precious resource. We do not want to swirl and leave people frustrated. Rather, we want to be fast and move quickly. And then the decisive part, decision-making is really hard, right? People want to be the decision-maker and hold the power, but with that power comes a lot of responsibility and it's really hard to do. So we're very intentional about how we structure the decision-making. We use a very uh, robust process to do that and kind of break it down into bite-sized steps. And then we tap every team member that's part of the, each engagement, part of each sprint team to really use the best of the thinking to help the decision maker make that ultimate decision about, do we go left? Do we go right? Which idea are we going to move forward with? And then the last part there, getting tangible results. Again, as I mentioned, we often, you know, our default is to have a big meeting, discuss a lot, but ultimately you might feel really good. Like, Hey, we're on the same page here. Maybe we had a really good brainstorming session but there isn't a lot to point to in terms of tangible, actionable results. It's one reason why we love working in Miro because everything is captured there in the platform. But ultimately we are designing within Miro a very structured process to get to something tangible. So a decision was made, an idea was selected and voted upon and evaluated. We decided to move that forward into execution. Maybe we've even mapped a roadmap for how to execute that, that idea. And maybe we've even set a timeline, a responsible person so anyway, those are the, the types of elements we're talking about when we talk about tangible results. Did I miss anything, Julia? Um, no, it's good. Okay, cool. I usually miss lots of things. Someone's like, Julia, help me out. So on the last bit here, before we kind of move on and get started with the session, right? We just want to highlight, there's a couple of different sprint workshops that we run, really three primarily. 
So you're going to get to see elements of each of these in play um, as we walk you through the cases in just a moment. I promise we'll get there, almost there. But the decision sprint process is really a much more fixed process. You'll get to see that actually at the end of our uh, three kind of case studies today. The strategy sprint is more custom. Uh, so the decision sprint is more about medium-sized challenges. We'll talk a little bit more maybe about what a medium-sized challenge is, but basically something that you can really, it, it warrants a bunch of brains coming together to work collaboratively, but isn't so big that you can't really make progress in just a two, two and a half hour session. A strategy sprint on the other hand is much more custom, tend to be a bit longer, and they tend to focus more on what the hell are we trying to solve for? What is the challenge? And so let's get our team, team kind of aligned on that challenge and wrap our brains around that before we move into maybe some ideation, evaluation, et cetera. And then the design sprint comes from Google and Google Ventures. We have the privilege of running a design sprint bootcamp uh, each year with the creator of that process at Google, uh, Jake Knapp. And so we really, you'll get to see an element of the design sprint at play in one of the cases that we're gonna walk through. So I won't spoil that for you, but just know that that's a really robust and incredible process for testing, rapidly testing and learning, uh, basically testing a solution really rapidly with your target audience. So again, we'll get to highlight a little bit more of that later. So I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen here for just a moment. And, and then, Eric, I'll, yeah, I'll share quickly. Today is all about storytelling. We found that it's um, it's great to learn processes by hearing the stories from folks who've gone through it. So we are thrilled to have had the opportunity to work um, closely with Jesse Wesser at um, Winthrop University on three different um, engagements and had the privilege of meeting her students and um, and being with Eli and Eleanor on two of those projects. And so we're thrilled for them to be here today because really you're gonna hear value from them. You know, we believe in what we do, but it's it's better to to hear um, from others about what they how what their experience was, what they learned from it and how it's being actualized. So um, without further ado, I'd love for Jesse, Eli, and Eleanor to introduce themselves um, to the group. Jesse, do you want to start? Sure. Um, thank you so much, Julia and Eric, for inviting me and also Mira for having us. Um, we are very excited to be here and also very excited to be using these tools and working with great teams like Wiley. Um, so I'm Jesse Weiser. I'm an assistant professor of design at Winthrop. Um, I've been here for about five years. But prior to that, um, I've worked in all sorts of design fields from graphic to user experience to product. Um, and so at Winthrop, I'm teaching foundation all the way up to senior level of design. Um, and so we have two almost soon to be graduates, super <laughs> exciting for them and super exciting for them to be here. Um, we have both Eli and Eleanor who are seniors. Um, Eli is an illustrator and Eleanor graphic design. Um, yes, yes, I see some applause there and I think it's due. Um, yeah, that's me. Um, Eleanor, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, um, hi, I'm Eleanor. Um, I'm a graphic design senior, as Jesse said. Um, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm excited to give my opinion and experience on Miro, which is all positive, I'll say. Um, and yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited. Okay, hello, my name is Eli. I am a queer illustration student at Winthrop. And um, I'm also very excited to share my experience and how it's sort of like kind of changed the way I see design a little bit. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for having me here. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate that. And again, thanks for being here with us today. So Jesse, we are going to move and trans transition and have you kind of help us wrap our heads around one of the sessions, one of the cases that we're going to be highlighting today. Cool. Um, we are really going to be diving into the senior exit project. So why don't you kind of set the stage for us, talk to us about this challenge, what we're trying to accomplish with this challenge. And then from there, I'll kind of pick up and, and highlight a little bit about the approach. And then again, we'll bounce around and, and pull in Eleanor and Eli into the conversation as well. But why don't you set the stage first about this one? Yeah, so um, the senior exit challenge that we did with Wiley was actually the, the, the third, no, second in the series. Um, and it's an exciting time for these graduating seniors like Eli and Eleanor. I had a group of 17 from all of our programs within our department of design. And so we house 
um, illustration like Eli, graphic design like Eleanor, but we also have interactive media, which deals with user interface, user experience, both design and development of digital things, um, and also interior design. And, and in their senior year, as one of their final projects, they have to create some sort of exhibition of their work. Um, but all of those sort of programs must come together to do it. And the added challenge this year was that, of course, we're in the middle of this pandemic and we have not been in class um, since last March. So it's been over a year since we've actually seen each other face to face. Um, this exhibition is generally some large event with 300 and some people. Um, there are as a website, there's other components to it. Um, but we had this challenge of what do we do now? And how do, we, how do we get all four of these different programs, all of these four different um, fields of study, and how do we create an experience for them um, during these certain circumstances that could still be celebratory, that could still be a showcase of their work, um, and that we could equitably um, show and exhibit um, all of the fruits of their labor, like the hard work that they've done over these four years and, and beyond, right? We know it's more than just the work they're doing in school. And so how could we, how could we as, as sort of um, the department give them a space to work together, together um, and, and solve this challenge? And so, so the challenge itself was how do we create this experience um, that was celebratory, that was engaging, um, that was an equitable showcase of, of all of their work. Um, and that's when we came to Wiley and said, can you help? <laughs> please, please help us. Awesome, thanks, Jesse. Yeah, so again, setting the stage, we have this, you know, this amazing opportunity, right? To help Winthrop students really tell their story compellingly. Um, I'm really curious though, from, to hear from Eli and Eleanor about what this experience was like, right? You've, this is almost a kind of a culmination of four hard years, like Jesse mentioned. And so what was this experience like for you? I just have to ask very open-endedly, uh, maybe start with Eleanor and then Eli, why don't you jump in after that? I think coming into it, um, I didn't think it would be so efficient and successful at the end. Um, but yeah, I think us being in small groups, we were split into small groups first, and then we had to um, come up with concepts and then uh, show the other groups the concept on Wiley, um, and then we kind of voted on them and gave our reasons why we thought they were um, good concepts. So, yeah, I think Wiley really kind of speeded up the process, but not in a um, not in a way that all of our ideas didn't get, you know, the exposure. I think all of our ideas were thoroughly thought about and, you know, reviewed, but Wiley really helped. Um, it just really helped narrow down and like focus on what we really want to do as a group. Um, so yeah, I think it really helped us focus because, um, you know, us seniors, we're all doing different things. We all have our different like um, motivations and goals, but we had to make, make a decision as a group. So Wiley really helped us do that in a quick period because um, we didn't have a lot of time. So yeah, I think it was successful. And before I, I'm gonna cut Eli off and just share with you a little bit about the process so you guys have a little bit of context and can kind of see what, you know, Eleanor is kind of talking about here a little bit. So. As Eleanor mentioned, we invited everyone ahead of time to source ideas and we gave them a very structured process for doing that. And essentially that's where we pulled from the design sprint kind of playbook or method and said, hey, here's a three part solution sketch process that the teams can take work in small groups like Eleanor mentioned and develop different solutions. So what you're seeing on the screen, hopefully it's loading, just give it a minute, it's a little blurry. There we go. Are some different solutions that each of the teams generated ahead of time. So these kind of three-part solution sketch, you kind of think of as a beginning, middle, and end. So the content's not terribly important, but I just wanted you to kind of get a flavor of what this looked like. So these kind of images. Eric, Eric, I'll add mm -hmm. here, there were 18 students. And so they were divided into five teams. Um, so these are the five sketches you're seeing here are from each of those, those five teams that they, they worked on. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And so what we did, we basically embarked upon a process, again, from the design sprint that looks something like this. I'm not gonna again belabor this, but just to kind of give you a little bit of heads up, there's a series of voting that happens, a speed critique in which people share out loud uh, the positives of the solution sketch from the other teams that they just shared out, a straw poll just to make a final selection from each individual and then a final super vote. So basically those details don't matter so much, but just know that there's a structured, very structured process that we went through, again, borrowing from the design sprint methodology in this case, to source and take those really great three-part solution sketches that each uh, team had developed from Winthrop, all the students, and then quickly whittle that down and make some final decisions about which one to move forward with. Because ultimately, and just to keep me honest here, but we wanted to kind of have a single unified container or theme to kind of guide, be kind of a North Star for what this exit project would look like ultimately, knowing that you could still pull from different discrete projects here. Yeah, and I think what I heard Eleanor saying was that maybe, maybe a fear, and I might be speaking for Eleanor, but going into it was like, how, how do all of these 17, 18 voices heard, as well as how do each of those programs express themselves in a way that it, it feels as though um, that everyone is, is having a say in it. And I think that going into it, I think many of the students felt that challenge, like, they were given this really large task that like you have to create this equitable showcase for for this entire department and how do we all come together and do that and i think up, up front knowing that they had to do this i think that that was one of one of the things that felt very daunting to them and maybe eli you could i don't know did you feel that way eli yeah, or, or I mean, the other <laughs> thing going into it that you were like oh my gosh how are we going to do this yeah i mean definitely i think my experience with like the senior exhibition even before this was sort of like I'm terrified of like how huge this is because it's hard enough to sort of come together to make a cohesive thing but then it's like we're com having to completely reimagine what the exhibition is supposed to be like because like we're not going to be able to get a space or maybe we will if we can make it safe for people and so like sort of before we used like some sort of like facilitation it was just like what are we gonna do how is this gonna uh turn out because we kind of saw the previous class have this pop up all of a sudden and um that was like really tough i'm sure and, and that was the experience i heard from the majority of the students they they had known what this thing might look like you know for the three years prior to this and then all of a sudden um hit with this pandemic and then and then not only was it this what eleanor is talking about like how do you listen to 17 voices and everyone feel heard but yeah how do you reimagine an experience that is typically in person um, but how do you how do you make that safe for people and i think that those were the two main things um that most of the students like going into it found us the biggest challenges and perhaps roadblocks. Yeah, so I mean, that, you know, that's a common theme that we find, right? It's like it, the challenge itself is hard enough, but then you have this double challenge of, well, how do we solve that challenge and, and do that in a meaningful, collaborative, inclusive way? And, you know, you could have probably defaulted to several meetings and probably had a lot of gnashing of teeth, which is something we see a lot of in swirling of decisions, kind of second guessing a lot of those, but instead, in a, just a couple of hours session, we were able to really narrow those down in an intentional and inclusive way that led to some clear decisions where everyone felt good. Even if it wasn't the decision that they wanted, they understood why the decision was made. We're ultimately on board after the session was concluded. And so to kind of carry the story, the story forward here. Eric, can I just add one yeah. thing to this too? Um, something that you'll see in all three of these stories, a, a thread in addition to everything being time boxed, we're, we're big believers in um, and putting constraints on time because we will fill whatever container of time we're given um, is also you'll see these these teal or blue sticky dots um, those each represent a vote and in all of our activities we use voting or heat mapping um, we find it's really critical to pause and let people weigh in um, using their dot 
uh, versus their voice. Um, we do have times where people can discuss and, and share their voice and share their bias and opinions. Um, but so often this is where processes like this devolve to the loudest voice in the room, the person with the most influence potentially, if there's a hierarchy, this is where pet projects get pulled forward because people, they just exhaust everyone around them into just submission and agreeing to move forward with something. We've all been in that situation, whether you're students and you know doing group projects or faculty meetings or with board members, like we've all experienced it. Um, by simply putting your opinion and attaching it to a blue dot, you're able to see where there's alignment um, and focus there. Um, and we have found if there's something you take away from this project or the, this, this webinar, it would be when you need to make some decisions or key inflection points, pause and give everyone the chance to weigh in silently with a vote and, and then see where you are, because you may find that you actually are far more aligned than you think. Um, and this is where they could have discussed this for hours and weeks, um, but instead we did this in, a, in an hour and a half process. And my students have actually even started using this on their own, on their own projects. So all of the seniors are working on their thesis. They're actually finishing up their senior thesis right now. But I saw in the in the early and middle stages, because um, always in the middle of their thesis, everyone wants to change their mind and sort of go back to the drawing board. But we saw the students start to implement this in their own personal processes. Um, this idea of like getting other people's opinions and feedbacks using this heat map method. I mean, so I think that it was quick, easy, and simple for the students to understand and then super accessible to apply in their own work. Um, and so I think the students really love this method for sure. Awesome. So to kind of close this story out and move on to the case study, because there's never enough time, right? We got to time box ourselves. Uh, ultimately, the, the container, the North Star solution was this one you're seeing here. And so I just want to highlight the fact that in addition, though, on the back end of that, it is completely fair game to marry and pull other elements of other ideas that got a lot of interest or a lot of heat and a lot of votes and pull those into the main idea where that makes sense. And so that's exactly what happened. You see in this solution, there's uh, this kind of epic packaging concept here, and then also came into play in another solution sketch. And then you'll see, and I'll Jesse's help here. I'm and, gonna ask her to help us out here. And I'll yeah. add to that, Eric, the solution that was chosen, the product long solution was um, the main focus on that was giving each student like their own platform um, and own like individual showcase. So they wouldn't be lumped together, but they would be able to be like teased out um, as part of this launch. And so Jesse, I'll ask you, unfairly to give me like, you know, the 30 second highlight of the kind of final uh, you know, product that's being launched here, the, ex the ex 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 exhibit um, for the seniors exit show. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a really short one and then maybe I'll have um, Eli talk because he's been working on this project um, for a bit. But so it, the final hasn't actually launched yet. We're still in the, in the process. And so I've put the link over there, but at the, the virtual exhibition will be launching on May 3rd. But throughout the, there's a series of sort of little teasers that are coming to each person. And one of the things that I think that came from, it was sort of a Frankenstein, which most designers hate this term, of sort of all of their ideas kind of in wrapped up into one here. Um, but I think the coolest thing that came from that is that in rethinking that experience, they said, we want to create the show for each individual person on their own time. And so they, they created these whole series of little touch points that could be sent out um, to people, both print and digitally, and then they're also sort of changing over time. Um, Eli, do you have anything to share maybe about the, the sort of how this all came just a bit? Um, sure. So I was a part of the team that was like doing a uh, creative direction after the meeting and it was it was really wild to sort of have all of these different ideas and sort of being able to synthesize them um, in this experience was really amazing. I'm really happy how successful this Frankenstein ended up being because I was uh, and my peers were also like kind of worried that we were pulling from a lot of different spaces. Um, but yeah, like I think what was interesting was in the process where we were discussing, we, um, like Eric was talking about, there's the like big areas where it's like, okay, we wanna do this, but then there's like the micro votes or whatever, the heat in the specific spaces. And so we could like look to those areas and be like, okay, well, we're not gonna do a drive-in movie theater, but we're going to give 
physicality in our final product. So we're gonna like use these things and synthesize that. So that was kind of what creative process was like. I think ultimately it was just about celebration and bringing joy to people. And so I think that that's what, that's what we see here. Awesome. So we're gonna switch gears quickly. I'm gonna stop my screen share and ask Jesse to repeat the process and give us a, a little bit of context for our second case study here, the DEI, so diversity and inclusion workshop. That's a big one. That's a really big one. I'm gonna make it quick though, as quick as I can. Um, of course, right now, um, our, our university and in particular our department is, is, is asking ourselves, faculty, um, students, alumni, um, leadership, how can we do better in areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion? And, you know, that's, that seems so large to me. And so I asked my friends at Wiley again, like, can you please help us? Um, we need to create some sort of way for, that we can bring alumni, um, current students together and give them a safe space to talk about where they see problems in these three areas. And then together, back to this idea of co-creation, how can we co-create solutions to help re rebuild our community and our department? And so that's where Wiley stepped in. Awesome. So yeah, that was, I'm sure, not doing it justice. But talk to us, Jesse. I mean, I think you did an incredible job of one, you know, really kind of making this again, very inclusive experience, right? You're, you're dealing with diversity, equity, inclusion. So we do not want to repeat the sins of not being inclusive and then turn around and have a process, you know, we want to be intentional about having a process very inclusive. So talk to us um, about how this played out, what this felt like. Again, I'm gonna share my screen and just show you a little bit about what it looked like. So if I do that right here, you know, just to give you just the tiniest bit of context before we ask um, everyone to kind of weigh in, our guests to weigh in here, we really walked through this process of having people working in parallel. And so we had, again, split up into three different teams. We actually started, um, Jesse did an amazing job of inviting a past alumni to kind of set the stage and be really honest about some of the shortcomings that he experienced while he was at Winthrop University, which really kind of set an amazing tone of openness and honesty and transparency throughout the process. But after that, the teams really worked in parallel to identify and source challenges. So what you'll see like in, in this little area here is a bunch of challenges that each team member had their own little column to work within. They source challenges. Again, as a group, they work to kind of whittle that down and find the heat, find the commonality amongst each team. And then as um, they ultimately weighed in and were able to whittle down to one challenge per group. So that's kind of where we ended up here. From there, and I'm going really fast through this, we actually sourced inspiration. So we focused on the challenge space first, then we sourced all types of inspiration. We did this kind of as a conversation, as a group. So kind of breaking the, the mold a little bit from working alone together, we kind of actually worked intentionally together to kind of break up that pattern. And then finally at the end, we began to hear some early solutions, some ideas, again, from each student working in their group and breakouts and ultimately kind of reframing a narrower challenge uh, or really kind of sourcing solutions around their more narrowly defined challenge that they had done in the previous activity. So again, I know that's really fast and kind of quick, but I wanna hear from Jesse, Eli and Eleanor again about the experience of working through this really tough challenge and, and then the, the format that we worked together on Miro. Well, and Eric, I'll quickly add, this was for 30 people, um, and it was a combination of faculty, students, and alumni, um, and we broke into small groups of 10 each um, and did Zoom breakouts, and I just would encourage when you're doing a, a big endeavor like this, particularly when it's virtual, um, and you do those small group share outs, one of the benefits of using something like Miro is that you get to be a fly on the wall because you can go back and see what other groups did, even though you weren't as part of those discussions. Um, so nothing's really lost. And the other thing is it's really important for groups to be able to come back and share out. So like what's happening in the small groups doesn't remain in a silo. So we really, were really intentional that every time we were in a small group, we would come back and share out with the full group so that we had the benefit of ensuring that everyone's voices were heard and captured. Um, because these types of sensitive conversations are, you know, would typically, you want to have them face to face and, and we couldn't do that obviously in our current setting. Um, so I'll turn it over to, to Eli and Eleanor and Jesse to kind of weigh in on what that experience was like for you guys. 
I, th I think, um, you know, it, back to like being heard. And I think this very specifically was about feeling safe and comfortable and transparent, like you said. And so I think that by starting off with this like very inspiring tone from our alumni, um, and then also ending in this very like empowering way, right, where we have all of these solutions at our fingertips um, that we have created together. Um, but I think that for me, one of the most remarkable outcomes of this is one of my challenges up front was creating a very diverse group of students to participate in this, right? And it also meant freshmen all the way up to alumni who had graduated 20, 30 years ago. Um, and so thinking about how freshmen would would perhaps maybe not feel as 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 sort of in, willing to talk, right? Like how would they feel in those in those situations? And and I will tell you, um, I, I was grateful, happy, um, excited because some of our freshmen were the people who who were willing to speak up the most. And I think it's because at the beginning we started with this sort of individual yet teamwork. Um, I see Eli shaking your head, and I think Eli was in my group maybe. Um, can you talk a little bit about how it felt like sharing and, and the, the sort of space? Um, definitely. I, I think it did feel like a very safe space to talk in. I think we, our group did spend like a little more time getting to know each other because we had like lightning introductions and then we just kind of kept talking a little bit, which I think was fun. And I think that's another part of this is it's very, very quick, but I, I don't think it's necessarily stressful or um, I, it feels like a casual environment where you, you can express um, the things that you need to, especially with these issues and the way that it's framed. We're talking about creating positive change. We're talking about sort of like looking at the way that we're doing things in a different way. And so it's, I feel like it's a lot more productive. Uh, this was because it wasn't about like, okay, this, I don't know, pitting people against people, you know, like having faculty having to defend themselves. It was like faculty and students and alumni were all saying like, yes, these are problems. Um, so that was really amazing. And then I think, um, Julia, what you were saying is that not only do you, do we have like these like one solution at the end of this, I think that from from the back end of this, then I was able to take this back to the faculty who who weren't present, and um, I was able to then share this with my chair, share this with the dean, um, and say that like yeah, here's where we see heat. Like here's some of the the main ideas that we know that we're about to start working on and putting into play next academic year. Um, things like creating a, a design for justice course or creating a research mentorship specifically for BIPOC students. Um, but we had all of this data now that we could mine, um, that we can go back to, that I can share with additional people. Um, and that, th so we had this, this, this collection. And I know that we used to do this, you know, on, on the wall often, and that was so hard to collect that data and then, and then synthesize it. And so I think that having this collection that I could share with the rest of our faculty and team members um, was 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 one of the the main benefits for us is, is they didn't have to be 100 percent um, there at the meeting but they could still share the ideas you could still see each individual um, comments or thoughts um, but also a collection of things So I know it's unfair of me to, to move us forward because we could spend the whole session on just that one case um, and, and more time, but I do want to save some time for Q&A. So I'm going to very, very briefly touch on the last case. Um, so this one was primarily, and Jesse, keep me honest, use, you know, to, this was the first engagement we ran with, with Jesse and some of her students, really using as a training tool, like, hey, this is what this process could look like uh, for, as an alternative to maybe typical brainstorming. So where that's uh, coming up with solutions, evaluating ideas, uh, the voting process that we use, we really wanted to teach that in a safe way. So there was a very specific challenge that was introduced as part of a project that Jesse students were tackling. But the highlight that I really want you to take away here is that this process is really focused on, again, medium-sized challenge, like I mentioned at the very opening. And if you take away anything from it, it's that, again, we're very intentional about the way we structure the the process so that you're really trying to align your team 
or the students in this case, are around a challenge. We then move into idea generation, evaluation of ideas, and then ultimately mapping next steps so everyone has a very clear understanding of what's going to happen next. So just very briefly, we have these ideation individual work areas. Uh, Angela Berry, who commented in chat, um, her team, uh, government team, uh, we work with her on a challenge of the, that they were facing using this very same process. So again, you have these different ideation boards that each person's work, again, working alone together on. You come together to on the shared area to do that, again, that heat map and voting that you've seen uh, in some of the other processes that in, other, in the earlier case studies to ultimately get down and kind of narrow the selection. And from there, we narrowed down to six ideas that were evaluated Eric, on impact. Eric, can I can I just jump mm -hmm. in here real quickly? Sure. Like the power in this is you're you're coming up with about fifty ideas off the bat um, between all the participants, and those ideas are never you know they're they're never lost. They're there because they're in Miro, which is great. You have this backlog to pull from. And those are then self filtered down to twenty four. So you're constantly moving down to like forced decisions. You're going from fifty to twenty four. And then you're choosing six ideas to move forward to evaluate on impact and effort, which is where Eric um, was. And I'll, I'll add, we met Jesse using this process with a nonprofit that um, she's uh, deeply involved with and that we were invited to come in and facilitate this process for. And we've done this with, I mean, too many nonprofit organizations to name, government entities, Fortune 500s. And we've also used this process, it's called the Decision Sprint. Um, to train a lot of university and, um, and school teams. So we just recently trained a bunch of um, leaders from Georgia Tech um, in this process. So anytime you're looking for an alternative to ideation and brainstorming sessions, look no further um, than, than here. So Eric, if you wanna pick up the evaluation stage. Yeah, so, you know, thanks for jumping in, Julia. So yeah, this is where we evaluate the kind of six top ideas that have emerged from, again, that 50 or plus ideas from the initial ideation boards. Uh, each individual is working on. And we're weighing in here on evaluation and metrics. Each indep independent person has their own kind of token with their initials so they can quickly weigh in again so we don't violently uh, agree, which is often the case. So we can actually just see where people's uh, thinking is. And if there is a big divergence, a point of divergence, we can also quickly um, you know, ask more about that. Why is that the case? That person might have a really unique experience and they might have evaluated that idea for very differently from everyone and might have a very good reason. So rather than having this kind of devolve into a, again, a kind of um, a battle, we separate each individual person's thinking here and then can see where there's both alignment and disagreement. And then ultimately we move to ne next steps. And so we ultimately move to two top ideas from there with the help of our decision maker and we map next steps. Again, I'm, I know I'm hitting this really, really quickly. We do have templates for this. So this is, available on Miro. You can have a free account. You can search for us in the uh, Miroverse and find the decision sprint template. We also have a design sprint template there as well, which is again, not our process that we created, but we created that template specifically for the way that we facilitate those. And we definitely encourage you to give those a try. The decision sprint is a really powerful tool. Like Julia mentioned, it's a very quick process, about two, two and a half hours for each uh, of these sessions. And we really encourage you to give them a, a, a test drive with your team and let us know how they work. Or if you have questions, definitely reach out. So we have just I've, a few minutes left. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, there are a couple of questions that came through chat that I'd like for us yeah. to address as part of the Q&A. Um, but first, mm -hmm. I have dropped into chat a link to the decision sprint mirror verse template. So um, feel free to, to pull that up later. Um, Robin asked a great question about um, how Miro and Wiley uh, thinks like this, you know, what's going to happen? We kind of get back to normal. I mean, we can be in the room together. Do we think um, it's possible to kind of keep this equitable decision making possible in real life as we meet in person? And I told Robin that we'd, we'd answer this directly. So, Robin, I will never personally go back to sticky notes and sharpies again, um, unless somebody like forcibly makes me do that, uh, because I like. We, we moved everything virtually out of necessity with the pandemic. We had been using Miro some for sure, but not exclusively. And we will not go back. We will continue to run, if we can be in person, all of our workshops um, on laptops um, using our Miro templates. And the reason for that is you can still get the power of being in person, but you don't lose these artifacts. So what happens, we've all been a part of it where we have this amazing experience and a room or whiteboards are full of sticky notes and um, sketches and great ideas. And it's so powerful. 
Um, but when you leave that room, that artifact's no longer there and your connection with it is no longer there. And unless you can have like a war room set up indefinitely, you lose that experience. Um, and there's nothing less satisfying than pictures of sticky notes dropped in a PDF. Like you're not gonna revisit that. Um, the power with Miro is you can immediately pop back in and it's like you're reliving that experience again. And it has sort of that like emotional effect too of like, oh, I'm back in the room. I remember what happened. I'm here with it. I'm not having to like jump through mental barriers to, to get back in there. And as Angela um, mentioned in chat, like she, she goes into her mirror board almost daily. Um, and that's not something that you can do if you're using like physical sticky notes. So um, for us, we do believe like these virtual platforms are going to be here to stay and we see so much power in them because they're li living breathing artifacts um, that can constantly be updated versus like static uh you know experiences so um we, we continue to use them even when we do hybrid stuff we've been fortunate to be able to do a few workshops in a hybrid model where it's in person but we all are on our laptops um, so that's one question. The other question that we've had um, was how do you kind of overcome user barrier, Eric? And I shared with them, maybe you can pull up um, above this, the crash course. So I had shared, we have, we created for this, for these purposes, we created um, a short video crash course. It's about six to eight minutes um, that just does like the highlights of what you need for Miro. So we have like our templates and our workshops are designed to be, um, or if you just pull up the, the crash course and the, Eric and the, um, Oh, in the actual, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah in here, yeah. Um, are designed to be um, really intuitive and we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of instructions embedded into our boards. Um, but we ask for everyone and we require them to do this, to watch the short video tutorial. And while they're watching it, they have a link to the board they're gonna be using. And then they just conduct some simple activities, getting into frame view, setting up their workspace so they can use Zoom, um, making sure they're swiping correctly, um, and then uh, we have two activities where we have them copy and paste sticky notes. Um, and this is how we can ensure that everyone's done the work. Um, and we were possible, we personalize the board to their initials. Eric, can you zoom in there? Mm -hmm. um, so we have everyone copy and paste a sticky note and then we have them edit a sticky note. Um, yeah. yeah, right there. Yeah, we have them copy and paste the sticky note. And this is where you can see we have their names, they have activity, and we can see who's having trouble. Um, if anyone's having user areas, we can user errors, we can address it ahead of time. And then the next frame, we have them edit a sticky note um, and we have them put in like a Netflix or book recommendation. Eric, can you zoom over to that one? And so this just ensures that people can do the basics. They can copy, they can paste, they can um, edit, they can get into frame view. And once they're in frame view, we can walk them through everything. Are there other questions? Yes. Um, beyond a crash course, are there any points of view or advice you would give me that have helped convince those in education who are less inclined to use technology? I work with faculty in higher ed that are sometimes reluctant to use something new. Jesse, do you want to address that? So I, I think that like, well, one, it's, it, it, it really is, it can be so simple. I think it, it can be very simple. And so I think that, that the sort of learning of it, um, when set up in a way, it, it can be fairly minimal. But I was on, I, re I remember the very first call that I was on, the first workshop that we did together, Eric and Julia, um, there was a person who who didn't get it right away. I don't know if you guys remember this. Yes. Um, and it it took, you, you, you both sort of walked them through it very patiently and it took up maybe about, I don't know, seven minutes or so to sort of catch them up to speed. Um, and then we could all move on. And so I think that like from the students perspective, they were all, you know, they had it figured out in, in a minute. Um, but I think that, I think that from, from faculty who are less willing to use technology, I feel like this is sort of a simple sort of gateway into it. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily see it as a deterrent. Um, not so much. I, I didn't experience that, no. I definitely understand. So I'm an instructional designer, and I've also been on the faculty side of things, kind of adopting new things uh, to jump in and use in class. 
I think though, um, I think the the biggest barrier that I've had this year with with the pandemic is that students just want new things to collaborate, to use, and to move forward. And a lot of the faculty that I've um, worked with, they've been a faculty member for a, a great time, a long time, and they just don't want to change their class. Everything is set in stone. They have everything just kind of in lockstep, and they don't want to work extra. And I kind of feel like I've tried everything from using like Miro Lite, which is, you know, the the light version of everything. Uh, it's making simple tutorials to walking everyone literally step by step through everything. And I feel like I'm speaking a totally different language. Um, I, I was I was an instructor for maybe 10 years before I jumped into instructional design. So it, it's not like I don't know the right vocabulary or, or things to frame. I just kind of I'm kind of curious from either perspective, either Wiley or Miro, if if there's any particular I don't know, what am I missing? What am I missing? Because I, I'm an ev a total evangelist for Miro, but I, I feel like I'm talking to a wall sometimes. Yeah, I don't think you're missing anything, but I will say that we often, depending on the client, and, and again, we work with a wide variety of teams, we often um, will demo the platform with the client team. Again, we're typically working with a change agent here, so they kind of get it, they already see the need, but we often lead with the challenge. And say, hey, we uh, we're really going to solve this challenge. We're going to focus on the outcomes we're going to get. And oh, by the way, we're going to walk you through every step of the process that you need to work on this really cool platform, Miro. So we really put less emphasis on the platform, and we try to make it a really simple like, here's a link. Just click on the link, and once they get here, like you just shared, we're kind of walking people through step by step how to get started. But I think. What we found is just like, if you can find that one evangelist um, who can give you a little bit of cover, and then I think it's just fighting the good fight, right? Doing what you're doing day in and day out and being really patient and persistent and slowing it down, making it really easy and as accessible as you can, knowing that you're going to, you know, some people, are, it's going to be a bell curve, right? You're going to get the early adopters that get excited, the middle you know, come along eventually, and then there's going to be that, that tail that you might not ever get. But I do think... Um, yeah, just being patient and fighting the good fight that you're doing is, is the best approach. I'll, I'll add, I think in the education space, it's critical to have those quick successes with students. So I'm a mom to teenagers. And after our first session with Jesse, I was blown away by the number of personal emails that I received thanking us for the session and how different it was and inspiring. That was one of the best things they had done in virtual learning. And and I know that that's not a norm, right? And so it had to have been a special experience and something that was atypical. And so I think if professors and teachers are hearing from students that this is fantastic and that they're engaged, particularly in like the virtual realm, it encourages you to take that extra step. So having some quick wins with, with people and hearing from students, um, I think is helpful. Is there anything, Eleanor or Eli, that, that you would add to that? Um, having been in this virtual realm now for a year? Um, I would say, I would say um, emphasize the outcome. Like what are the students gonna get out of this? You're gonna get your voice heard. You all want, you all have your own ideas. You wanna, um, you know, express them. This is the best way to do it. Um, so we don't all argue or it takes longer than it should. This is a quick process. Um, because I know a lot of students don't have a lot of patience. Um, so yeah, I'd emphasize that, that the students will feel accomplished at the end and like their voice was heard. Yeah, I also feel like these platforms are sort of the future of design and being able to be inclusive and address systems that are oppressive and racist and I think it's a very, very important thing to move towards. And I think that kind of understanding the weight of those things would be a definitely something to like have some leverage, I guess. Thank you for sharing uh, all those perspectives. Uh, I wanna thank Jesse and Eli and Eleanor, especially for their time and contributions. It's uh, priceless and valuable. I'm hoping everyone else got as much out of that as I did. Um, I always, we're always, it's a treat to work with you guys. And thank you to all of our guests. Thanks to 
and Natalie, especially, and her team also for helping make this happen. Uh, Natalie, I guess we can turn the, the reins back over to you to kind of close this out. And I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for attending as well. Really appreciate your time and hope that you uh, got something valuable out of the session. If you have any questions that we can be of help to you at any point, uh, do reach out, find us, and we'll, we're happy to help. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a really insightful session. Uh, I mean, even for me, I'm really impressed with the um, with the challenges, with the commitment from the uh, staff and the students, uh, with the outcomes that you got. Uh, this is very inspiring to see how um, universities can innovate uh, in the ways they work together uh, with not only students and alumni as well. So this is really exciting to hear such stories. And uh, we are recording this video. We will be uh, publishing and sharing uh, afterwards together with the links that we mentioned uh, in the chat today. So thank you very much for uh, preparing this discussion. Thank you for participating. Uh, thank you for your questions. And would be great if we could inspire you to try some uh, sprint activities uh, in your decision making process and be more collaborative, be more uh, innovative. That's the goal and hopefully we could do this.